changed hands several times. We talked about the Holbrecht brothers, the two German brothers who bought the property. They were into brick production, but they were also they also decided to diversify from cotton. They brought in about 15,000 pecan trees, and they planted pecan trees throughout the property. They made a commercially viable crop of pecans until about 1911. 1911, we had a Category 5 hurricane come through here. It was an unnamed storm between Charleston and Savannah. Uh, it took about 40% of the commercial viability out of these pecans. 1989, Hurricane Hugo made it financially impossible for us to make a profit out of the pecans. Cotton on the left-hand side, there's a demonstration field of cotton. This is coastal cotton. Once again, this is the, uh, the small crop of cotton that we grow for demonstration purposes only. Cotton is a member of the hibiscus family. There's a beautiful white flower that needs to be pollinated. That's why you see the beehives behind the cotton field. Now the cotton, this was a demonstration crop. We try and keep cotton growing throughout the year on the property somewhere. It's not unusual for us to host 15,000 school kids a year. They're here to learn about the history and the architecture. We try and teach them a little bit about agriculture as well. How difficult it is to get the crop into the ground and how difficult it is to get it out. On the right hand side where these folks are walking through the field, this is our polo field. There's a cattle egret out there in the middle of the field. It's one of the most popular birds in North America. In fact, around the world, cattle egrets are second only to crows. It's hard for me to see them. The property is currently owned by the McRae family. The McRae family purchased this property in 1955. They were farmers from North Carolina, but the McRae's were also the first people to start to open the historic importance up of the area to tourism. Um, the McRae's were the first people to open the property up to tours. They were also responsible in 2019 to make sure that this property was protected under what's called a conservation easement. That makes sure that none of these roads can ever be paved. None of, no more dwellings can be built on the property. The, the way you see it today is the way it will be in perpetuity. Behind the pecan grove, you can see a very large forest. We've got about 350 acres of forested property. That allows us as land stewards to accept a larger wildlife load. As all of these housing developments go up around us, the white-tailed deer, the turkey, the otters, the minks, the bobcats, the coyotes, they all have to have a place to live. So having this forested area protected by the conservation easement makes sure that we can remain, we can keep being a nice buffer, a nice buffer of the property to keep the wildlife. <laughs> to keep the wildlife on the property and keep them healthy. On the right hand side we've got a hedgerow system. Now the hedgerow separates us from some of our smaller agricultural fields. Where the early settlers would have clear cut this area, we've learned to make smaller agricultural fields the norm, to put dense hedgerows around those fields. That protects the topsoil from erosion. It also allows you to grow heirloom quality vegetables in smaller fields. Those fields, as we come to this farm junction road on the right hand side, you'll be able to get an eyeball on some of those fields out there. Now at this time of year, there's all, they're all filled up with a cover crop. That cover crop will either be top sown rye, top sown wheat, or buckwheat. This is the forested area I was telling you about. You can feel the temperature start to drop. It was a dense overstory and a dense floor canopy, a uh, dense canopy and a, and a dense understory here. That is the forest that's on Fort John, or, or, that's on Boone Hall Plantation. This is a very young example of a maritime forest. Um, if it were mature, it would be more open and airy. The larger trees would take over the sunlight coming down to the ground. Besides being an important buffer for wildlife, it's very, very important as farmers to us. If we have a tremendous rainstorm, if we have a tropical system come through, that excess water does not end up in a stormwater system somewhere out into an estuary. 
Now water is absorbed by this forest. That's important to us as farmers because that replenishes a shallow water aquifer. That shallow water aquifer is the least expensive way for us to be able to extract water from the ground to irrigate our crops. If we had to pay to have a deeper well system go, if we had to pay to bring water in for our irrigation purposes, it may tip the balance of profitability for a lot of the farm land that we still have. It's not unusual at this time of day to have white-tailed deer just inside the tree line. When they hear the tractor, they will freeze and they won't move. It's, very, it's kind of difficult to get your eyes adjusted to see them. It's not uncommon to see them out here in these woods or in some of these fields we're about to drive into. We've got about six different species of oaks. We've got one indigenous species of pine that's worked its way into this area, it's a loblolly pine. It would have supplanted the first pines that were out here, which were southern longleaf. Southern longleaf pines did very well here. They were harvested for board feet of lumber. They take a little bit longer to grow, and we have tried an experimental planting of southern longleaf pine here on the, on the plantation try and get it back into its indigenous area. The deciduous trees that you see are mainly sweet gum. We've got a lot of maple that grow in the area, all the leaves changing. On the left hand side in front of the tractor you're going to see in just a moment a movie set that was left here from 1993. There was a movie here filmed here called Queen. Queen was the last of the Alex Haley Root series. There's a sound set that was made in 1993 right there, the Henderson Store. The Henderson Store is there. Um, it brought a young actress to move to screen for the first time. Her name was Halle Berry. She filmed her early scenes in front of Henderson's General Store. She was the proprietor of, the, proprietor of that store in the movie. Eight acre cornfield on the right hand side. It coincides with our October pumpkin patch and our family festival in October. Um, we put a maze in every year. We found out that parents might like to drop their kids off for about 45 minutes to an hour after they've been to the carnival eating cotton candy. So we put a maze in the property every year. This year we found out that the kids are using their smartphones, taking a picture of that sign, which is a CAD drawing of the maze. And they're going into the corn maze and coming out in 15 minutes instead of an hour. So next year we're going to change the sign and not tell anybody. <laughs> On the other side of the ditch on the left hand side are our 22 acres of event field and you pick field on highway 17. We've got a lot of kids that enjoy picking, a lot of uh, people that enjoy picking their own produce. So we rotate produce throughout the year in these fields and allow the public to come in and pick their own. Uh, this ditch on the left hand side here has a lot of historical significance. It was dug over 340 years ago by enslaved labor. Not to drain these fields. King Charles II of England had commissioned a road to be built from Charlestown in the Carolina colony to Boston and common in nowadays Massachusetts. It was known as the King's Highway. It was completed about 1740. After the revolution, the King's Highway became the Coastal Highway. After the Eisenhower administration in the 1950s, the Coastal Highway turned into U.S. Highway 17. It's still out there today. But the ditch has been here so long, it's become its own small ecosystem. Um, it's not uncommon to see wading birds and reptiles and amphibians living along the banks here. The field behind the corn was buckwheat and top sown rye last week. Now it has been disc under for a winter planting of vegetables. Now what those vegetables are, we're not sure, I'm not particularly sure of yet, but I know they're getting ready to plant. 
the only time you would disc under your cover crop is when you were getting ready to put something down because that exposes your topsoil to erosion. Now they would have disced under live plants, live buckwheat, live rye, live sorghum. That reintroduces nitrogen back into the soil. But it also allows that plant to decompose underground. That decomposition of plant benefits the microbes in the soil, the bugs that eat that decomposing uh, plant material enrich the soil so that's why we've got a beautiful loamy soil out here as opposed to that sandy soil that you saw underneath the first field of buckwheat because we have properly rotated this year after year vegetable barn on the left everything that we grow on Boone Hall plantation that goes to market we pick by hand we, <coughs> we pick it before it matures we package it and we put it into a drive-in cooler that allows us to slow that maturing process down. It also allows us to match our harvest times with our highest market values. So we get the most dollar per acre out of everything that we grow. The hedgerow that we're in right now separates our three largest agricultural fields on the property. 22 acres on Highway 17. The 14 acre field we just came out of that has the eight acre cornfield and 19 acres in front of Andrew, our driver. That 19 acres now has our number one cash crop, strawberries. Strawberries in South Carolina can be planted the last week of October. We did just that. We planted 150,000 150, strawberry plants in this one field alone. Now in northern climates, strawberries are a perennial plant that can produce year after year. In the south, our heat in our summertime kills them. So these strawberries that we planted in October will be ready for harvest the first week of February. That puts us ahead of major markets. That allows us to compete with larger markets like Florida and south of the border. So that gets us more dollar per bushel on our strawberries. So that's why Boone Hall has now become a strawberry producer. That is our number one cash crop. The electric fence is the only real effective way to keep white-tailed deer out of it because the deer love strawberries as much as we do. They'll actually eat the plants before the strawberries come out. Behind this hedgerow, we've got a couple of indigenous species of crops. Those crops are tall bush blueberries and grapes. Now our blueberries historically have all gone to our roadside vendor. We have now have one consumer, which is a microbrewery in Charleston, who buys about 30% of.